Hey, whether your wide receivers have been catching deep balls or sucking b- and eh, never mind. Let's just talk about some wide receivers for week 14. What is going on, everybody? Jake Fantasy Headliners. Welcome to week 14 of the fantasy football season. It is almost over. Can't believe it going so fast. Today we're talking wide receivers, all the matchups, who can we trust, who can we not trust. It's another one of those critical weeks. Want to make sure we make the right decisions. And we're going to go through every matchup like usual, talking about a wide receiver on each team, trying to help you guys make those difficult decisions here before your week 14 matchup. Doesn't matter if you're in the playoffs or, or playing the spoiler. You want to make sure those lineups are set. You don't want to uh, go out and be that guy that just kind of quit in the, the end of the year. Go out there, play spoiler, have some fun with it. That's what we're here for anyway, right? Having fun with some fantasy football. Now, let's talk about some wide receivers here in week 14. All right, starting off with the Jags and the Titans. And this is my excited face because it's fake because this game probably won't be that exciting. For the Jacksonville Jaguars, you have D.D. Westbrook coming off a great game of what? Three for 25 yards. Dante Moncrief had what? Three catches for 40 yards. Not one of these high-powered passing offenses that we can count on every single week. It's a decent matchup. The Tennessee Titans have been struggling as of late, giving up on average 37 points per game to opposing wide receivers, including five touchdowns over their last three games. The problem is the Jacksonville offense will be back to a run-first type of offense with Leonard Fournette back in the mix. I don't trust anybody in Jacksonville here week 14. All right, for the Titans, we pretty much have Corey Davis to talk about, and he's been playing better, right? Three touchdowns in his last four games. Four double-digit games out of his last five. Definitely an improvement from what he was earlier in the season. Now he gets the Jacksonville Jaguars defense who absolutely shut out the uh, the offense of the Indianapolis Colts this past week. They did allow 100 receiving yards, but have only allowed two receiving touchdowns to opposing wide receivers in their last five games. This is definitely a defense you don't want to deal with if you don't have to. There's not a whole lot of options in Tennessee. I can see them trying to take away Corey Davis and limit that offense to, to having them try to beat him with like a Taewon Taylor. Not going to be pretty. Corey Davis, just too risky, in my opinion, for a Week 14 start. He's going to be one of my sits for the week. Jets and Bills are next, so these games are just getting more and more exciting. For the Jets, it's almost at worse than the Jacksonville Jaguars. You really can't trust any of these guys either. Quincy Anunua, two catches for nine yards. Jermaine Curse, nothing. Robbie Anderson contributed with a whole four catches for 48. Nothing in this offense screams consistency or reliability, something that you would want to throw in there, at least as a flex spot. I'm not seeing it. And then they're going up against the Buffalo secondary, which is second against opposing wide receivers, giving up 27.9 points per game. However, they have given up three receiving touchdowns their last two weeks. But that really doesn't matter. It's more of an issue with the offense in New York than it is the defense of Buffalo. I'm not touching anybody in New York this week. All right, for the Bills, I guess we can talk about Zay Jones to have somebody to talk about. The kid has actually played pretty well lately, and it's kind of hard to believe I'm saying something nice about a Buffalo Bills player. So Bills Mafia, see, I can do it. I can I can do it. Chuck, I know you're watching, Chuck. But this is, this is one of those guys that am I excited to throw in? No, not really. Uh, if it's a deep league, you know, 14, 16 team, something like that, or you have multiple flex spots and it's just kind of a deep league, Zay Jones isn't a horrible option. It's a great matchup, the 31st ranked defense against of the New York Jets, giving up on average almost 40 points per game to opposing wide receivers, giving up touchdowns three straight weeks. Now, Zay Jones is, is somebody who's kind of benefited from having Josh Allen under center. Josh Allen will somewhat limit the upside of some players at times because he runs a lot but he's productive with it. Zay Jones, two out of his last three games played, has had over 20 fantasy points this past week against Miami. Four catches, 67 yards, two touchdowns. The kid has talent. He's never had a quarterback. Josh Allen isn't as bad as a lot of people think he is, and he's actually putting together some decent offense. Zay Jones, in a deep league, flex play only. If you're in one of these 10 or 12 team leagues, it would be really hard for me to start Zay Jones. Giants and Redskins are next for the Giants. We'll have Odell Beckham and Sterling Shepard. Sterling Shepard, to me, somebody who's still dealing with that rib injury, is not somebody who I would trust for Week 14. He just hasn't quite been productive since that those ribs have really started to bother him. Odell Beckham, you're starting him every single week. He's the number seven fantasy wide receiver. Right now, averaging close to 20 points per game in PPR leagues. Definite must start, and it's a great matchup for him against the Redskins. Expect to see another Josh Norman, Odell Beckham matchup at some point. That should be fun. Uh, but yeah, it's a great matchup for him. The Redskins have allowed five 
uh, receiving touchdowns to opposing wide receivers in their last three games. Odell Beckham, slam dunk, home run, must start every single week. For the Redskins, we got Jamison Crowder and Josh Doxson, but they're really not the issue. It's the Sanchez. Mark Sanchez, do we trust him to put together a productive fantasy wide receiver? No, I don't. I really have no interest in anybody from Washington because I don't think Mark Sanchez can be consistent enough in a game against a tough defense. The Giants are the seventh-ranked defense against opposing wide receivers, giving up on average 30 points per game, which doesn't sound bad, but they've only allowed three touchdowns to opposing wide receivers in their last six games. Definitely a tough matchup. Not exactly the ideal matchup for Mark Sanchez to kind of get him acclimated to the offense more. Uh, I'm expecting a little bit more of the same from what we've seen from Josh Doxson. Jameson Crowder is good to see him get back on the field, but what he did this past week, four catches for 36 yards, and Josh Doxson contributing with his whole, what, three catches for 51. I see those numbers kind of being similar here on out rest of season. Saints and Bucks are next, and for the Saints, I know I'm disappointed too. Michael Thomas has kind of disappeared the past couple weeks but what do we do this week? It's a great matchup against the Tampa Bay Bucks. You're obviously not going to sit Michael Thomas. Even though he's only had nine catches for 78 yards combined over his last two games, he's somebody you have to start on a weekly basis. Traquan Smith looks like he's going to be good to go this week. He's going to be risky, though. He's been battling injuries the past couple weeks, had a breakout game week 11, and then we haven't seen him since. Keith Kirkwood is a name that keeps coming up. But that's really because he's scoring touchdowns. He's not seen the volume to be productive. He's had two catches combined his last two weeks. Both of them were touchdowns. Highly touchdown dependent. Not somebody I would trust on a weekly basis. Right now, Michael Thomas is really the only name that I would start for sure. Deeper leagues, 12, 14, 16 teams. Looking for a flex play. Uh, Have some injuries that you're dealing with. Traquan Smith has some upside, but let's make sure that he's practicing fully before the end of the week because it's a great matchup going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Like I said, giving up almost 40 points per game to opposing wide receivers. They've given up a receiving touchdown every single week this season, at least one of them. Great start for Michael Thomas. Hopefully he can get back on track. And Traquan Smith, just more of the risky play in larger leagues. A lot of the same for the Tampa Bay Bucks too. I think there's a lot of offense that's going to happen in this game. A lot of throwing in this game, especially by Jameis Winston. They're going to struggle getting that run game going against that New Orleans Saints defense. That will lead to more pass attempts. I can see Jameis getting close to 50 pass attempts this week. Majority of them going to Mike Evans, who's going to remain a must start this week. Uh, Adam Humphreys is actually going to be one of my starts of the week, though. This is somebody who's really been a pleasant surprise. He's not going to go out there and get you the huge receiving numbers, but especially in PPR leagues, he's a safe, solid, consistent start. He's had double-digit fantasy points five out of his last six games, touchdowns in three straight. Definitely a part of that offense. Definitely somebody that Jameis Winston looks for, and it's a great matchup going up against the Saints, the 32nd-ranked defense against opposing wide receivers, giving up 45 points per game to those opposing wide receivers, mostly because they're trying to play catch-up the entire game to catch back up to the Saints. The Saints are going to look to get going again. Love all the wide receivers in Tampa Bay. Humphreys will be one of my must-start starts of the week. Evans always is every week. And Chris Godwin, somebody else with some sneaky value, great flex play here again for Week 14. Pats and Dolphins are next. For the Pats, we have Josh Gordon and Julian Edelman. Julian Edelman will be one of my starts of the week this week because of his consistency also. Somebody who you can really rely on in a critical week like this going into your fantasy playoffs. Last week was his worst week of the season. Three catches for 25 yards. However, even though he struggled, he still provided 35 yards of rushing on two carries, giving him nine fantasy points for the day. Now, is that great? No, but that's the absolute floor for Julian Edelman. That was a tough matchup going up against that Minnesota Vikings defense. Now they get the Miami Dolphins defense, giving up on average 34 points per game to opposing wide receivers. Gave up two touchdowns last week to Buffalo. They've given up over 100 yards receiving to those opposing wide receivers three straight weeks. Definitely a decent matchup for the guys in New England, and I expect that offense to continue to get on track. I expect him to come out quick. I see a lot of passing in the first half, a lot of Sony Michelle in the second half. Love Julian Edelman this week. Josh Gordon, to me, though, he's a little bit more of a risk. He hasn't quite been getting the volume that he needs to be a must-start every single week. Now, he's still a decent play, more of a flex play at best, though. Last week, three catches, 58 yards, really saved it with that touchdown. He does now have four straight weeks in double digits, so he's a solid flex play. His ceiling is just somewhat capped with just because of all the options they have in that offense. For the Dolphins, we kind of have somewhat of a jumbled mess of hot garbage. What do we do? Danny Amendola dealing with injuries again. Do we really want to start Devontae Parker, a.k.a. Bigfoot, in the fantasy playoffs? Kenny Stills 
has that home run big play potential. However, he's only done it a few times this year. Last week, four catches for 37 yards and a touchdown. None of these guys scream overwhelming must start. Somewhat of a difficult matchup against the Patriots, who've been playing a lot better as of late against the pass, giving up on average still 34 points per game. Uh, They have given up a receiving touchdown four straight weeks. But I'm not overly excited to start anybody in Miami. There may be that big play potential for Kenny Stills, but I don't see any one of these guys being a solid PPR play, somebody that I'd feel comfortable with. Maybe in a very, very deep league, Kenny Stills as a flex play, maybe hopefully it's a standard league because the volume just isn't there right now for any of these guys. Too risky for me in week 14 unless you're, like I said, one of these 12, 14, 16 team leagues. I'm going to avoid these guys altogether. Baltimore and Kansas City are next for Baltimore. They're going to have to throw the ball a little bit in this game to have a chance. The Kansas City Chiefs can score points, and they can score points on anybody. Yes, they may score a little bit less against that Baltimore defense, but what does that mean? They still score, what, 30? This is still one of the best offenses in football, and Baltimore is going to have to throw the ball. Lamar Jackson is going to have to throw the ball more this week to have a chance at this game. They're going to want to try to control the game on the ground. They want to limit the offensive play of the Kansas City Chiefs. The, the, the Ravens can do that on the ground. However, if the Chiefs get out to an early lead, they're going to have to abandon the Gus Edwards train, and they're going to have to start looking towards the likes of a Ty Montgomery, maybe even a Willie Sneed or Michael Crabtree. The problem is we really don't know in this offense. Lamar Jackson hasn't consistently locked on to anybody. Maybe Mark Andrews is the safest play in this passing offense as a tight end. None of these guys can be counted on week in and week out with Lamar Jackson under center. It's a great matchup going up against the Kansas City Chiefs where we know they're going to have to throw against him. We just don't know who he's going to throw to. And if he's really going, are they just going to run no matter what? That's a risk right now with the Baltimore Ravens offense, and I'm not willing to take it. In my opinion, in a deeper league as a flex play, I would go Ty Montgomery before I would go any with other wide receivers. I just can't trust him yet. For the Chiefs, we don't really want to get too cute here. We still want to start Tyreek Hill. Yes, he had a bad week last week, costed him with some some costly drops there, kind of uncharacteristic of Tyreek Hill. And now they get the number one ranked defense against opposing wide receivers and the Ravens, giving up only 27 points per game. No touchdowns allowed to opposing wide receivers the last two weeks. But we don't want to get too cute with this offense, right? The the Kansas City Chiefs can score points, and they can score points on anybody. Tyreek Hill is going to be the must-start. Sammy Watkins' status still unknown whether he plays or not. If he doesn't, Chris Conley does have flex value. Uh, He didn't have a great week last week either. But this is just one of those offenses. If you can put a piece of it in there, you always have that potential for a a high-ceiling game. Now, the ceilings may be dropped down slightly because of their matchup against Baltimore, but they're all still decent plays here in Week 14. Colts and Texans are next for the Colts. We got T.Y. Hilton. And this is a tough matchup for T.Y. Hilton going up against the Houston Texans, the eighth-ranked defense against opposing wide receivers, giving up on average 31 points per game. However, they have allowed two receiving touchdowns in their last two games, which is a lot better than what they were doing middle of the season. They didn't allow a receiving touchdown from Week 7 to Week 11 in Houston. Definitely one of the top defenses in football as far as containing the opposing wide receivers. But T.Y. Hilton's going to see the volume, right? He had a tough matchup last week against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Still put up eight receptions for 77 yards. Now, in a tough matchup like this, do I sit T.Y. Hilton? Probably not, but I do limit the upside a little bit. The ceiling will also be dropped down on T.Y. Hilton. He may not be that surefire wide receiver one, but he's a solid low-end wide receiver two with huge upside. Can't sit him, just tempering expectations slightly for T.Y. Hilton. He does have four straight double-digit games. Andrew Luck's going to be out there, you know, trying to get that offense back on track after being shut out basically last week against the Jacksonville Jaguars. I still think T.Y. Hilton's a decent play for Week 14. All right, for the Texans, we have DeAndre Hopkins, who's an automatic must-start every single week. Demarius Thomas, who's highly inconsistent. Kiki QT, who just can't seem to stay healthy. And at this point, I don't know if I'm willing to risk it for the biscuit on Kiki, do you love me? Now, Demarius Thomas is somebody who I thought would have a higher ceiling with Kiki out. However, last week didn't really do a whole lot with it. Three receptions for 32 yards. It's going to go through DeAndre Hopkins. And I think part of the reason these wide receivers' upsides have been limited is because Lamar Miller has been effective in the running game, and they're not having to rely solely on the passing game. At this point in Week 14, DeAndre Hopkins is the only guy that I feel extremely comfortable with. If you're in a 12-team league or larger and you're looking for a flex play, it's an okay play for Demarius Thomas. Tough matchup going up against the Colts. Fifth-ranked defense against opposing wide receivers. However, they have allowed five receiving touchdowns in their last five games. 
There's a possibility. However, it's not a huge possibility that Demarius Thomas gets into the end zone. High risk play. Could be a high reward play, but right now the only one I feel comfortable with, DeAndre Hopkins. Falcons and Packers are next. And for the Falcons, you got Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, and Mohamed Sanu. All three, which I would pretty much start this week if need be. Julio Jones, yes, coming off by far what would be his worst game of the season last week. Two catches for 18 yards. That helped absolutely nobody. Calvin Ridley, somewhat limited also. Three catches for 22. Mohamed Sanu, three catches for 37. That was against a very difficult Baltimore Ravens defense. Now they get the Green Bay Packers, who are allowing, on average, almost 38 points per game. Last week against the Arizona Cardinals, it's the Arizona Cardinals, so we really can't count that game because there's not a whole lot of offense. However, they have given up three receiving touchdowns in their past three games. This is definitely a a decent matchup for the, the Falcons. One thing we need to pay attention to here. It's the winter months. What is the weather going to be like in Green Bay on Sunday? Is that going to limit the upside of any of the passing game recipients? We need to wait and find out. Make sure you're tuned in to the Rotoballer Game Day show live on Sundays, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll be able to give you all that last-minute weather update. That's something we need to pay attention to. If the weather is clear, I expect all three of these guys to be involved this week. I expect the uh, the Aaron Rodgers-led Packers to kind of turn the corner a little bit. Hopefully, now that Mike McCarthy is gone, that will lead to more rece- uh, more passing options for the, the Falcons. Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, Mohamed Sanu, all decent starts here for Week 14. For the Packers, it's easy. You start everybody named Devontae Adams, and you sit everybody else. Yes, this offense could take a slight step forward, but until we see it happen, I'm not risking it with anybody outside of Devontae Adams, who's proven that he's almost matchup proof, one of the best wide receivers in football, the top target of Aaron Rodgers, right now wide receiver three in PPR leagues. Everybody else, too risky in my, my opinion. Panthers and Browns are next for the Panthers. We still have hashtag never funches. That's never going to change. That will remain. You also have DJ Moore, who I expected more out of la- expected more out of Moore last week. Uh, he didn't really produce great numbers. Uh, he only had four catches for 44 yards, chipped in another two carries for 21. Curtis Samuel has been playing great football as of late. He's somebody who's been actually more productive volume-wise. Six catches, 88 yards. Uh, This past week, he now has three touchdowns in his last five games. Double-digit fantasy points, four out of his last five games. He seems to be taking a small step forward. Now with Greg Olson out of the offense, that opens up more targets for both of these guys in a decent matchup against the Browns, who are 25th against opposing wide receivers, giving up on average 38 points per game. They have allowed three receiving touchdowns to opposing wide receivers in their last three games and have not allowed less than 138 receiving yards to to opposing wide receivers since week eight. It's a decent matchup. Uh, More volume headed towards Moore and Samuel. Never going to go on the Funches bandwagon, but Moore and Samuel are somebody who I think could have some sneaky flex play potential in PPR leagues, especially in those leagues, you know, 12 teams or larger. All right, for the Browns, we have Jarvis Landry, and we actually had a Jarvis Landry sighting last week. We all pretty much basically started to write him off. He comes out six catches, 103 yards. That's what we expect more often from Jarvis Landry. We know the touchdown numbers aren't going to be huge, but the volume we expected to be there all season long, and it really hasn't been. But this is going to be a decent matchup for him. The Panthers are giving up on average 39 points per game to opposing wide receivers, and they've given up multiple touchdown receptions to opposing wide receivers four out of their last five games. I like the upside for Jarvis Landry. Hopefully this wasn't like a tractor beam to suck us in to have him be horrible again. But I actually like Jarvis Landry going forward, especially as a flex play in PPR leagues. The guy has some serious upside. As far as Antonio Callaway, Rashard Higgins, they're all highly touchdown dependent, big play dependent, not something I would risk here in week 14. Broncos and Niners are next for the Broncos. We have Cortland Sutton and Emmanuel Sanders. Now, Cortland Sutton had a decent game last week against the Cincinnati Bengals defense, which is totally banged up. However, only had four catches, but got the 85 yards and the touchdown. Emmanuel Sanders... Came in there with four catches also, but only for 19 yards. What has happened with Emmanuel Sanders? Somebody who was so consistent early on in the season. Heck, even two weeks ago, week 12 had seven catches for 86 yards in the touchdown. Seems to be disappearing at times in this offense. A lot of people are saying, well, it's because Cortland Sutton is taking a step forward. Not so much. He had four receptions in this game, right? Did Cortland Sutton? That's the most he's had in a game all year long. Four. And it was a big play touchdown that really saved his fantasy day. Am I super excited? And do I have a lot of trust in Cortland Sutton that he's going to go out there all of a sudden and get that big play automatically? Or maybe even double his reception total and get me eight this week? 
Uh, not so much. Emmanuel Sanders has, has become more of a risk. He's still wide receiver 15 in PPR leagues right now, but he only has one touchdown in his last five weeks. Definitely somebody who's started to regress as the season has gone on. It's a decent matchup against the San Francisco 49ers, who are the 19th ranked team against opposing wide receivers, and they've given up eight receiving touchdowns in their past three games. Somebody's going to get one. Who is it going to be? Right now, my money's a little bit higher on Cortland Sutton, but it's a risk. They're both a risk at this point. Neither one of them are higher than a flex play for me here in week 14. And and even though the upside is there due to the matchup and and the way that the the 49ers are giving up receiving touchdowns as of late, we just don't know which one it's going to be. It's not like this is one of these high-powered offenses that's going to go out there and get multiple touchdowns every single week. Worried about both the guys in Denver. If I had to pick one here for week 14, though, I got my money slightly on Cortland Sutton. For the 49ers, we really don't know who they're going to have, right? We don't know if Marquise Goodwin comes back yet or if Pierre Garçon is back, but what we do know is Dante Pettis is a real option. He's produced huge numbers the past couple weeks, three touchdowns his past two games, over 200 yards receiving in those two games combined. Definitely a great option going forward, but mostly because the only other option they have in that offense is is George Kittle. So Dante Pettis is really producing decent numbers, and it's a decent matchup against the Broncos, who have given up a receiving touchdown, at least one of them, every single week since week six. It's a decent defense to play against, giving up on average 36 points per game. If Garcon and Goodwin sit, Pettis becomes almost a borderline must-start flex play in all leagues. The potential, the upside is there, and he's building that rapport with Nick Mullins. It's a decent matchup for him here in week 14. Bengals and Chargers are next for the Bengals. We have Tyler Boyd and maybe John Ross, who has some sneaky upside if he can get into the end zone. Tyler Boyd is still a safe play. His ceiling may be drastically lower than it was earlier in the year. No more A.J. Green. He's now going to be the number one there with Jeff Driscoll under center. Kind of limits the upside somewhat, but last week, six catches, 97 yards, uh, 15 fantasy points in PPR leagues. But it's somewhat of a difficult matchup this week against the Chargers. They're giving up on average 32 points per game. That's good enough for 10th in the NFL. However, if if I had to take a look into this game plan for the Cincinnati Bengals, I can see the Chargers being able to score on the Bengals almost at ease. If that's the case, they're going to have to rely a lot more on the passing game in Cincinnati. Uh, Tyler Boyd is still a very safe option, in my opinion. May not have that super high ceiling we saw early in the season, but still a solid play. John Ross, more of a DFS play in my opinion. Somebody who has huge upside in a game where they're going to have to throw a lot. If he can beat the secondary for that long ball with that blazing speed, could put up a decent fantasy day and not have to get a whole lot of volume to get it. Last week, two catches for 13 yards. Hasn't had more than three catches in a game every game so far this season. However, he does have touchdowns three out of his last four weeks, so that's something to pay attention to. If he can get into the end zone, he could be a decent flex play for you here in week 14 also. All right, for the Chargers, we'll talk about Keenan Allen. Uh, The other guys, Mike Williams, Tyrell Williams, they're kind of hit and miss. Hopefully you're not reliant on starting one of them at this point of the season. If you had to gamble on one of them, I would say Mike Williams would be slightly higher just for the touchdown upside. But Keenan Allen is an obvious must start. I'm pretty sure I've been on the Keenan Allen bandwagon all season long, even when it wasn't really popular. A lot of people were were down on Keenan Allen to start the season. He wasn't putting together those big games. Well, he started to down the stretch here. Three straight games over 20 fantasy points this past week against Pittsburgh. 14 receptions for 148 yards and a touchdown. Automatic must start. I don't care who they play, really. Keenan Allen is so involved in that offense, especially now that there's no Melvin Gordon. Keenan Allen could put up some big numbers for the weeks to come. Lions and Cardinals are next for the Lions. We got Kenny Galladay, and I'm not overly high on him this week. Yes, he's playing the Arizona Cardinals, and a lot of you are like, wait, that's a decent matchup. It's the Cardinals. But more than likely, he'll be paired up with Patrick Peterson, who will shadow him all game long, and he's one of the top corners in all of football. That will already limit his upside a little bit. We don't know if Kerryon Johnson comes back. If he does, that also limits the uh, the upside for Kenny Galladay, where they could rely a little bit more on the run, since the Cardinals are such a poor defense against the run. Kenny Galladay, since week, uh, let's see here, since week five, has only gone over 90 yards once. He's somebody who's kind of struggled as of late, a little bit more than a lot of us expected, especially once Golden Tate was shipped out and then Marvin Jones has been out. Kenny Galladay hasn't been that top number one wide receiver like we somewhat expected. He's a risk for me here in week 14. If you have no better options, then you could roll him out there possibly as a flex play. But I'm really limiting the upside, really limiting the expectations on Kenny Galladay this week. It could turn into one of those games where he somewhat disappears. 
For the Cardinals, we only really have Larry Fitzgerald to talk about because Christian Kirk was placed on IR. He's done for the year. Larry Fitzgerald is going to be one of my starts for the week now, though, because there's really no other options in Arizona, right? He still had somewhat of a safe floor. This past week only had three catches for 48 yards. However, had double-digit fantasy points his prior five games, including five touchdowns over that span. He's definitely somebody who's involved in this offense, and now he'll get more volume with Christian Kirk out. It is a decent matchup going against the the, uh, Detroit Lions, giving up on average 34 points to opposing wide receivers. This past week against the Rams, limited to only 148 yards in the touchdown. But like I said, there's not a whole lot of options in the receiving game for the Arizona Cardinals. It's going to have to go through Larry Fitzgerald. I expect an uptick in volume, which could lead to an uptick in production. Already has the high touchdown upside. I like Larry Fitzgerald for Week 14. Steelers and Raiders are next for the Steelers. Juju and A.B., They're must-starts every single week. I can't imagine anybody out there really has to determine whether they need to sit Antonio Brown or Juju Smith-Schuster, both ranked inside the top 10 right now for fantasy points scored for uh, for wide receivers and PPR leagues, both in a great matchup going up against the Oakland Raiders. Must-starts, in my opinion, here for Week 14. For the Raiders, we really only have Jordy Nelson, and it's crazy to even talk about him. But he kind of had like a resurgence game last week, coming out with 10 receptions for 97 yards. Where did that come from? He had like 10 combined receptions all the way back to like week four. What happened with Jordy Nelson and where did that come from? Is it something that he can produce again? Eh, not so much. Going up against the Pittsburgh Steelers this week, who give up on average 35 points per game to opposing wide receivers. And last week they did give up 258 yards receiving and two touchdowns to the wide receivers of the Chargers. However, the bulk of that was to Keenan Allen, who they played in the slot against opposing linebackers. Basically leaving Keenan Allen open on every single play. I don't expect the same from Jordy Nelson. Jordy Nelson is not the same as Keenan Allen. This is definitely a better secondary, an improved secondary uh, in Pittsburgh. And to me, Jordy Nelson in Week 14, possible fantasy playoff matchup, to me is just too risky to rely solely on what he did last week, thinking that he can do it again this week. Eagles and Cowboys are next, and for the Eagles, I don't like anybody this week. None of them. Golden Tate, Alshon Jeffrey, Nelson Aguilar. Not really a fan of any of them. Why? Mostly because they're playing the Dallas Cowboys, who could arguably be one of the best defenses in all of football, giving up on average 27 points per game to opposing wide receivers, good enough for second in fantasy football. Last week against the New Orleans Saints, don't forget, they only gave up six catches for 70 yards and a touchdown. That's it. They've only given up three receiving touchdowns to opposing wide receivers since week six. This is one of the best pass rushers in football, one of the best linebacking crews, and one of the best secondaries in all of football. I want nothing to do with the Philadelphia Eagles wide receivers who are already struggling in that offense. Last week, Alshon Jeffrey, 3 for 31. Nelson Aguilar, 4 for 56. Golden Tate somewhat salvaged it with a touchdown. He had 7 for 85 in the score. However, this offense just isn't really clicking. If your name is not Zach Ertz in this offense, I really don't have that much of an option or or of a want to start them. I'm going to sit all the wide receivers in Philadelphia this week. I think it's too big of a risk against this defense on the road in Dallas. All right, now the long-awaited time for Amari Cooper and the Dallas Cowboys. What do we do with Amari Amari Cooper this week? Now, you guys know in the past, if you've watched this show for a while, I'm not the biggest fan of Amari Cooper. However, since his trade to the Cowboys, he has been somewhat more consistent, more of what I would like to see on a weekly basis. Is that huge game that he had Week 12 going to happen every other week? Probably not. But he has been consistent. Eight catches for 75 yards this past week against the New Orleans Saints. He's not a bad option. Going up against the 30th ranked defense of the Philadelphia Eagles against opposing wide receivers. Giving up on average almost 40 points per game. With all that being said, I still think we need to come to some sort of an agreement here. Okay, I will give truthful analysis of Amari Cooper whether he should be a start or a sit. But in return, I get to keep the nickname Amari Pooper. Listen, some things just can't change. I got to keep the nickname. It's been there for like two years. However, I did just preface that with saying he's not a bad option this week. It's a great matchup. It's a matchup in which Amari Cooper could see very, very high volume against a secondary that, let's be realistic, the Philadelphia Eagles secondary is almost non-existent at this point. They have had a decent couple games. They haven't allowed a receiving touchdown to an opposing wide receiver the past two weeks. 
However, Amari Cooper is highly involved in this offense. I can now say that he's starting to get more consistent on a weekly basis. It's a great matchup. He's a great start here for week 14. But I got to keep the nickname. I, I, I got to call him Amari Pooper. Rams and Bears are next. And for the Rams, these guys are almost must-starts every single week. Robert Woods, Brandon Cooks. Josh Reynolds is the one question mark on a weekly basis. He doesn't quite see the volume that the others do to make him a must-start every single week. Last week against the Lions, only two catches for 19 yards. Wasn't overly involved in the game plan. This week, though, going up against the Chicago Bears, definitely easier to throw on the Bears than it is to run on the Bears. They've given up a total of five receiving touchdowns to opposing wide receivers over their last four games. Good enough for over 38 points per game. This is one of the top offenses in football. I'm going to start Robert Woods and Brandon Cooks automatically, of course. Josh Reynolds, though, as a flex play this week, isn't a bad option in my opinion, especially in those leagues 12 teams or larger. He has the upside playing for one of these offenses that you can just put up points in absolute bunches. Could be a fun game. Hopefully Mitch Magic, Mitch Trubisky comes back in this game. We can see a little bit of firepower going back and forth here. Kind of a lot of the same for the Bears on their side of the football, right? Allen Robinson, Taylor Gabriel, Anthony Miller, none of which I would say are must-starts this week. But they all have decent upside and potential as flex plays here in Week 14. Going up against the Rams defense, which has allowed eight receiving touchdowns by opposing wide receivers over their past five games. Definitely a team that you're going to have to throw all four quarters against, right? The Rams can score points a lot, and they can score them quickly. They're going to have to continue to throw the ball. Jordan Howard is not what you would call one of these running backs who's going to take over the game by any means. Tariq Cohen will be involved in the passing game, but Robinson, Gabriel, and Miller all have huge upside in this game. They all have huge touchdown upside in this game just for the fact that they're going to have to throw all four quarters against this Los Angeles Rams team. Vikings and Seahawks are next, and really Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs, must starts every single week. Doesn't really matter on the matchup. Decent matchup against the Seahawks, but both these guys, if you have them, they've probably carried you a lot throughout the season. Throw them in your lineup. Count on them. Hopefully they can carry you through the fantasy playoffs. Different story on the other side, though, for the Seattle Seahawks. I'm not really trusting anybody. Maybe Tyler Lockett as a flex play at best in deeper leagues. But going up against this Minnesota Vikings defense, which just seems to be clicking all at the right time, right now they're the sixth-ranked defense against opposing wide receivers. Now, they have given up at least one touchdown over their past three games. However, since week five, they've only allowed those three receiving touchdowns. Definitely a solid defense in Minnesota. Really limits the upside of a lot of players. But they may be more big play dependent in this game. That's where that's where Tyler Lockett comes into play. He's more of their big play threat in that offense. If anybody, Tyler Lockett would be the only one that I would trust here in Week 14. All right, those are all the wide receiver matchups here for Week 14. Hopefully that was able to help you set your lineup. Make sure you comment below if you have other questions. Really looking forward to Saturday's live show, 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. I uh, really enjoy interacting with you guys, going back and forth, having some conversations, really getting to meet and know some of you guys. It's a lot of fun. Make sure you go there on Saturdays if you haven't checked it out quite yet. Good luck this week on your fantasy playoffs or the week leading into the playoffs, depending on your league. Hopefully you have a good one. We'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye.